the heavy feeling on your heart, the unpleasant aura of disagreement that everything within you wants to avoid. I mean, it's so much easier just to talk about nice things, the playoffs, right? Now that the Browns are in, right? Here we go. The weather, avoid politics altogether. Rather than embracing the awkwardness of addressing the elephant that's in the room, every single one of us has been there. The moment that conflict presents itself in relationships. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, whether you're here and you say, I've been following Jesus my entire life, or you say, I don't believe in Jesus, or you're somewhere in between, you know the pains that come when conflict finds its way into your relationships. I mean, some of you here, you aren't close to a lifelong friend anymore because of conflict. Some of you have a conflict between a, you and a family member, and anytime you're near them, it's just like it feels like your energy is drained from you. Maybe you left another church and you've made River Tree your home because of conflict, something that was going on at the church. Or, or maybe you gave up on church altogether because of conflict, but now you're trying to trust again. Maybe you're here and you have a nasty job situation. You got fired, walked out altogether, or simply are dealing with this contentious relationship with a coworker. If that's you, go ahead and take a look. Maybe for you, the source of conflict in your relationships is with your spouse. You know, when I heard that I was teaching on conflict, I figured rather than spending the time to prepare a sermon for you, I would just tell you story after story of fights that Becky and I have gotten into over the years. You know, um, I remember when we were in college, um, you know, we really did, you didn't have a lot of places to fight in college, right? Couldn't go to your dorm room because your roommate was there. You couldn't go to the cafeteria because there were a ton of people there. So Becky and I would fight in the car. Anybody here do that? I know some of you did it on the way here. Let's be frank, right? <laughs> so we would get in fights in the car, just kind of what we would do. And I remember there was one evening we were sitting out in front of her dorm, or we were arguing over something that was stupid probably. And um, as we're arguing, I see somebody walk by and kind of ignore him. Uh, the next day, one of my friends comes up to me and says, I heard you and Becky broke up. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, I, well, I heard that, that you were just arguing oh, in the car. I got, oh, oh, man, I, was, I told him, I was like, that, that's just a normal date night for us. Like, that's part of it, right, is that you have dinner and then you argue for like a couple hours and you're fine. Um, you know, every single one of us could look at some petty argument, something that we got into an argument about with somebody. But the truth is there's some of you here today. And the reality is while we can talk about the funny sides of arguments, the truth is there's a conflict in your life right now that is serious. There's something in your life right now that is serious, and you might even be to the point in the relationship where you are considering dissolving that relationship, cutting off relational ties because the conflict has gotten so bad. It's beyond what you can grasp, beyond what you can fix. You feel overwhelmed by it. You know, we've been in this series called It's Complicated. We've said, hey, you know, in, in all the things that, that life throws us, one of the most complicated things is relationships. Whatever relationships you're in, while they can be so life-giving and good, some of those beautiful moments we have in life are relational. At the same time, those same relationships can take life from us, can't they? They, 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 can, they can harm us. They can hurt us. And, and so we're in this tension where it's really easy just to simply say, well, I'm just going to withdraw from relationship altogether or to say, I'll just yield to the dysfunction. But what if there was another way? See, you know, one of the things I know about Jesus is that Jesus didn't just come to fix our relationship with God. Jesus came to fix our relationships with each other. Do you know that? That's part of why Jesus came is because Jesus knew that our relationships are broken and tattered and fragile and that so many of us have wounds and pains from the past. And Jesus came not just to fix the relationship with God, but to say, I'm going to fix, I'm going to transform and heal the relationships that you have with other people. See, one of the things that we forget, because of Jesus, as long as you still have breath within your lungs and that person who you have a conflict with still has breath within their lungs, Jesus can heal and transform and renew. There's always hope because Jesus is in the mix. And God wants you to have healthy relationships. You know that? That God cares about your relationships. He cares that they're healthy and good and life-giving. God cares about that. And one of the ways that you and I can have relationships that are healthy is being able to deal with conflict in a healthy way. Now, some of you are like, can you talk about conflict and healthy in the same sentence? Like, those seem like you know, antonyms, like they're against each other. But 
but Jesus seems to speak about them in a different way. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And maybe you're here, um, and, and you have no idea where you're at in your relationship with Jesus. You don't believe in Jesus at all. And that's okay. One of the things I love about this church is that this church is a place where you can belong before you believe. You can belong before you behave. You can be loved here and welcomed here. And you might go, I don't, I don't know what I believe or I've been hurt or I'm in pain. But this church loves all people. I love that about this church. I love it. And so my encouragement to you, if that's you, my encouragement, just be open. Just be vulnerable a bit to the possibility that something we have to say here might be helpful for you in your relationships. Because I know whether you're following Jesus or not, you want healthy relationships, don't you? You want relationships that are life-giving and good. I know that. I know you want that. So just open yourself to the possibility. Maybe something we have to say today can be helpful for you. Um, we're, if you've got a Bible, we're going to open up in Matthew 18. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 15. And uh, we're going to hop around a little bit, but we're going to turn to Jesus' words here for a few moments. Um, I, I don't know if you know this or not, uh, but Jesus lived in a context, in a world that was mired with conflict, disagreement, brokenness. The people around him had relational wounds and hurts and pains. They had a ton of mistrust. They were bitter. They were angry. And as Jesus is going along and he's teaching, he's teaching about a, a ton of things, the question comes up, Jesus, what, how are we supposed to handle conflict when someone hurts us? How are we supposed to handle conflict when someone wrongs us? When, when, when someone, their words cut so deep, how are we supposed to handle that? What are we supposed to do? And to that question, Jesus responds this way. Matthew 18, verse 15 says this. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Now, some of you would like the sentence to stop right there. That's it, right? Just go tell them they're wrong, right? But that's not the end of it. Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen... Take one or two others along with you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. L let's say they don't listen. They refuse to listen to the three of you. Tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to the, even the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything that you ask for, it'll be done by my Father who's in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. Jesus says, you know what? When you're facing conflict, you don't tweet it. You don't post it on Facebook, and you don't talk to everybody you know before you talk to the person. You talk to them. Whoever you've got conflict with, whatever the hurt, the pain, the baggage, you talk to them directly. You don't talk behind their back. You don't try to defame them. You don't post it on social media. Go right to them. And let's say they respond. If they respond, if they respond, that's great. But let's say they don't respond. Let's say they don't take it seriously. Well, if that's the case, then you bring one or two other people with you. And the pur purpose for doing that is just to get a few more people in the room. The conflict's taken more seriously. You have more people there to be able to process things. And so bring them. Their, their goal is to fight for the health of that relationship. They're there not to fight against you, but to fight for that relationship. They're there. But let, let's say they're unresponsive to the plea of a few other people. We'll share it with the leadership of the church. Tell the church there is this person, there's this dysfunction, this relationship. We've gone through this course of action. It doesn't seem to work. And allow the leadership of the church to, to try to fight for healing and reconciliation. Now let's say none of that works, Right? You've exhausted every single option that Jesus has provided. Jesus says, now, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And I've heard some pastors, and I've heard some people say, well, that means treat them poorly. Treat them negatively, right? You treat them lesser than, right? But let me ask you a question. If you, if you know Jesus at all, how did Jesus treat tax collectors? How did Jesus treat pagans? People who didn't believe in Jesus. Did he withdraw from relationship from them? Did he judge them? I mean, the Jesus that I remember is one who delved into it. He, he, he didn't separate himself from the tax collectors and the pagans. He immersed himself with the tax collectors and the pagans. He surrounded himself with them, but he recognized that those people hadn't yet experienced Jesus. They hadn't yet taken the good news, the hope, the healing, the forgiveness that Jesus offers. So you, you change the way that you see a person. As you've exhausted every single option, at the very end of that, you go, I might not be talking to somebody who sees Jesus, who hears Jesus. 
See, you know, here, here's the thing. When it comes to conflict, you know, I think we're really quick to, to simply avoid conflict or to minimize it, and we think that it'll go away. Any of you done that before? Come on now. Come on. I know you have, because I've done it. I've been there before. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Just kind of kick the can down the road. Now, I'm not saying petty, small things or personal frustrations. You know, Becky gets frustrated with me um, because I, I always put our, my socks. This is a weird thing I do. I put my socks in our couch, um, and there's like 30 black socks within our couch. If you were to come over and turn over the couch, I have no idea why. It's a stupid thing. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to move forward and get reconciliation for that. But, um, you know, we're not talking about those small things. We're, we're talking about these big conflicts, right? So many times we try to overlook it or brush it under the rug. But you and I know this to be true. See, relational conflict doesn't go away with inattention. It only festers. It worsens. It deepens. It gets worse and worse over time. You know? um, so many, many years ago, um, when I was living with my mom, my single mom, um, there was a few years where money was tight. And uh, my mom's a barber. Uh, money was really tight, so we decided to go live at my grandpa's house. And my grandpa lived in this 150-year-old, huge, old, blue colonial house. You know where everything's old in it, right? You know what I'm talking about. The trim is old. The windows are old. The floors are old. Everything's old, right? And so one night, my brother and I had a few friends over, and we decided, because we had just watched WWF wrestling, right? We said, we're going to try to do some of these moves upstairs in grandpa's room, Right? So, um, you know, we're sitting there on the bed, jumping off, doing suplexes, all kinds of stuff, right? And I'm in the corner of the bed, and my brother decides to, to climb up on the corner of the bed, and I think we got a picture here. He tries to do a drop kick. Sorry, that guy's almost nude. Um, <laughs> but he decides he wants to do this drop kick to try to, to, try to kick me um, in the air. And so he jumps, because he has so much courage, right? And I rolled out of the way, and then all of a sudden you heard this crash, Right? And my brother has half of his body hanging out the window on the second story of this house, right? Shattered glass all over the floor, right? All over the floor. My brother's hanging out of, of the, this house. Um, and so, you know, I pull him back in, and we're sitting there, and we're just overcome with fear, right? We're looking at the ground. There's shattered glass everywhere. We look at this window, huge hole in the window. Like, man, we can't, we can't fix this. What are we going to do? So we took a second, and then we created this master plan. You ever been there before? This is going to fix it all. This is going to be it. We're going to fix it. It's going to be perfect, right? So we decided, here's our master plan. You're going to think it's genius. We decided to sweep up all the glass that was shattered, throw it in the trash, and then just to pull the curtain over the window, and that was going to solve it, right? It's pretty, pretty genius, right? The problem was it was mid-January, so it was really uh, quick. To, my grandpa was quick to see uh, because he was going, wow, man, it feels, it feels a little drafty in here, right? Before you know it, he comes to us and says, hey, there's a window that has a hole in it. What would you guys do, right? You know, I think too often um, we try to avoid conflict because we think things will get better when we avoid it. And the reality is it only worsens and compounds. So that should be a reason for us to be able to not avoid conflict, but to address conflict. Not to be afraid of conflict, but to address it. To fight for that relationship, to fight for the health of the relationship. You know, one of the, the big red flags for me in premarital counseling with couples is when a couple tells me, oh, we never fight, we're never going to have conflict, we never fight. And I go, what? Right? Any person in here who's married knows what I'm talking about, right? You go, I don't, okay, sure, right? Just give it a few seconds after the honeymoon's done, right? Because the truth is that the healthiest relationships aren't those that say, hey, you know what, we're going to run from conflict. The healthiest relationships are those that say, when conflict arrives, we're not going to run from it. We're not going to neglect it. We can't afford to. We're going to address it. We're going to face it head on. We're not going to let it have power over us. But see, another reason that we should embrace conflict is because conflict presents opportunities for grace. Conflict presents opportunities for grace. Notice what James 5.16 says. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Healing comes when we address the conflict head on. When we confess our sins to each other, we're praying for each other. That's when healing is experienced. 
You look throughout the Bible, if you know anything about the Bible, the, the highest points of God's interaction between God and humanity is not moments where God is fleeing conflict. It's moments where God is delving into conflict. In the tension points, the, the moments where there's pain and anguish and a mess, that is where God's light shines the brightest. Story after story shows that God is at work in the toughest times. In the most painful times, the hardest conversations, the most painful relational tensions, that is where God shows up the best. But so often, we just avoid conflict. In Galatians 2, we read about this conflict between two guys who are pretty important in the early church, a guy named Peter and a guy named Paul. Peter was a follower of Jesus in Jesus' earthly ministry and a leader in the early church. He had walked with Jesus. He had experienced Jesus. Paul's life was changed by Jesus on this sudden day. He had this radical transformation where he used to persecute the church and persecute Christians. And now he was starting new churches all, all around the world. You see, these two guys love Jesus. Two guys that are passionate about Jesus. They care about the church. But this conflict arises between Paul and Peter because Paul notices that Peter was favoring certain Christians over others. He was treating them differently. He was treating the Jewish Christians better than he was the Gentile Christians. Notice what he writes, Galatians 2.11. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. See, sometimes the most loving thing we can do is not to avoid conflict, but to address it. Because a lot of times we go down these paths, and, a lot, and they're destructive paths, and it is more loving for us to have that conversation that is challenging and difficult. That's what Paul does for Peter. He says, I see you doing something that's destructive. I see you doing something that's contrary to what Jesus would, what, would want you to do. So he doesn't run away from it. He addresses it face to face, deals with him face to face because he cares about Peter. He cares about his life and his ministry. If you know anything about Jesus, you know that he didn't shy away from conflict, did he? He wasn't cowering in fear. He wasn't going through life afraid he was going to make this person mad or that person mad or step on these people's toes. No, see, Jesus laid down his life by dying on a cross. The greatest conflict, defeating death and sin and shame that you and I might have life and experience grace. Praise be to God that Jesus addressed conflict head on. Yeah, you know, when I look at my relationships, um, I look at my relationship with my wife, Becky. I look at my relationships with my family members and friends. I am continually reminded that some of those beautiful moments in those relationships were moments of grace that stemmed from conflict. When we were frustrated with each other, when we were struggling to communicate with each other, when, when our priorities weren't aligned and things weren't right, those were moments of honesty. Those were moments of vulnerability. Those were moments, right, we, we could have easily run away from each other. We could have easily avoided the conflict. We could have brushed it under the rug. But instead of that, we decided to, to take it head on. And I think too often when we run away from conflict, you know what we miss? We miss opportunities for grace to win. We miss opportunities for grace to have the final word when we run away from conflict. So if Jesus says that conflict isn't this inherently bad thing that we're supposed to run away from, but instead handle it head on, how do we do it in a way that's good and healthy? How do we do it in a way that doesn't create this bad wake behind us? Real briefly, I want to give you a couple principles that you and I can carry with ourselves as we head into conflict, because conflict will come. The only way that you can avoid conflict is to kill relationships. That's the only way. You don't want any conflict in your life? Great. Don't have any relationships, right? Because the moment you have relationships, you're going to deal with conflict. So I want to give you just a couple key principles that, that, uh, that God gives us when it comes to dealing with conflict. The first is this, react slowly. React slowly. Proverbs 15, 28 tells us this. The heart of the righteous weighs its answer, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. And how many of us, we gush emotions? You ever been there? Man, I'm angry. I want everybody to know I'm angry. I'm frustrated. You did this to me. You said that hurtful thing to me. I want everybody to know that I'm frustrated. When someone wrongs us, what do we do? We want to respond quickly. 
But see, if you and I took a moment, we just took a moment to pause. And we didn't react. We just took a moment to pause, react slowly. It took some time to ponder. My guess is that there, it would give us a, a couple things that would come from that that would be good for us. The first is it gives you emotional distance from the situation. And I'll tell you, some things look dif dis different from a distance, don't they? You know, I have this rule that I call the 24-hour rule. Um, and uh, I learned this from a past minister who had learned this from uh, an Abraham Lincoln biography. But basically, if I get a frustrating email or I have uh, some, somebody I'm angry with or angry about, something like that, I'll take 24 hours to just think on it before I react. I'll just take a, just a moment. Just a, just, a, just a few moments just to say, man, I just need a little bit of space. Because it's amazing to me how much clarity I get when 24 hours passes. Like the words of my email change in 24 hours. The way I respond to my wife, the tenor in my voice changes in 24 hours. The way I respond to my girls changes in 24 hours. See, reacting slowly just gives us space to be able to see things from a different perspective. With distance, we're able to just see and go, what's my part in this? What's my side in this? What's he or she really trying to say through this? The second thing I would say is to resist superiority. Resist superiority. I don't know if you've been there. Maybe I'm just a horrible person. Um, but, you know, I have at times when I'm dealing with conflict, I've thought to myself in the midst of the conflict, I would never do that. I'd never say that. I would never respond that way. I've even thought, man, they're messed up, right? They're the messed up ones. They're the crazy ones. I'm right. I'm on the right here. I'm on the right side. I've thought that time and time again. But see, to handle conflict well, we've got to own our own shortcomings, our own failures, our own weakness, our own waywardness. We have to acknowledge that there are times that we have used words that are harmful to people. There's times I've used words that are harmful to my wife, to my girls, to my staff, to my friends. Until you own that, until you, if you approach conflict with superiority time and time again, it's not going to end well. But if you and I are able to see ourselves as one of, if we're able to have humility into conflict and say, you know what, I'm going to own my weakness, it changes the tenor of that conversation. You realize that you're made of the same stuff as the person that you have conflict with. Made of the same stuff, valued by God, loved by God. Third thing I would say is respond graciously. Respond graciously. You know, when we are offended, I think there's like this little tuning fork that goes off inside of us. We feel wronged, and automatically, it's like a reflex, automatically we feel like repayment needs to be given. You ever felt that way before? Someone wronged you, someone hurt you, someone said something, and the first thing you're thinking is, how do I get them back? How do I say something that, that, that cuts deeper than what they said to me? How do I do something that, that hurts as much as they do? So we do that by repeating, right? Sometimes we literally repeat the action back to them. So if someone said something harmful to you, what do you do? You say something harmful back. Someone brought something from your past up, what do you do? You bring something from their past up. They hurt you, you hurt them. You do right back what they did. If you can't figure it out that way, the specific way, then, then you just find another way to hurt them. Maybe it's yelling. Maybe if you're a passive person, you do the silent treatment. Any of you have done that before? And you could try to baptize it and say, well, I needed some solitude. But the reality was you go, I'm not going to talk to them. I'm just going to take 48 hours. I want them to stew when they're guilt. That's what I want, right? So sometimes we just literally repeat the action back. Sometimes we repeat the action to others. So we've been hurt by somebody. And while we, we can't muster up the courage to hurt them, what do we do? We hurt somebody else. We hurt a coworker. We hurt a family member. We hurt a friend. We've been hurt. We hurt somebody else. Sometimes we repeat the action to ourselves. So you just find yourself taking that moment and just repeating it in your mind. Over and over and over again, you stew on it. You dwell on it. It leads you to be resentful. You become bitter and angry. And you don't know how you got so angry. But it's just stewed. It just sat there. It's like a slow cooker, just stewed. Year and year. Day and day, it just sits there. See, when we respond with repayment, it only worsens the relationship. It doesn't get better. 
But instead of heading into conflict with vengeance, what if we head, headed into conflict with grace? Notice what Proverbs 25 says. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Some of you are like, just, just let me just put the burning coals on their head. That's what I want, right? I just want to hurt them. That's what I want. I just want vengeance. They said gossip about me, so I want to say something about them. They, they hurt me. I want to hurt them back, and I get that. I totally understand how you and I could be there, but something happens when someone's treating you like a jerk. Instead of responding that way, when you respond with grace, something changes. And that person, they begin to think and they go, man, I'm confronted with the guilt of how I handled that. I'm confronted with how I said that or the way that I said it. I'm confronted with the words I used. I'm, I'm confronted with, with my own shame, my own guilt. When you and I respond with grace, it's a catalyst for something good. You know, oftentimes we think that the way to change somebody is to make them pay. You know, man, we'll make them pay. Th then they'll know, right? Then they'll get it. Then we'll see change. But I'll just berate them. I'll be sarcastic to them. I'll be silent to them. I'll be standoffish. Then they'll get it. But, you know, in God's kingdom, the way that we see change is through grace. It's not shame. It's, it's not making them pay. It's grace. See, there is no sin too great, no pain too deep that grace can't change. There is no shame that is too real for his love to heal when grace is in the mix. Grace changes everything. Every relationship, every previous wound, every dynamic that you think is too big or too dysfunctional, grace changes it. Grace can change your marriage. It can change your relationship with your best friend. It can change dysfunctional relationships with you and your family, you and your kids and your grandkids. Grace can change it all. So when we head into conflict, the goal isn't to punish. The goal isn't, I, I, I want them to feel the pain I have felt, but to restore the relationship and to heal it. And when we respond with grace, we pave the way for healing. Last thing, um, as we head into conflict, just encourage us to remember Jesus. You know, I think a lot of times we, we don't see ourselves the way that God sees us. And because of that, we, just, we create this mess of decisions because of who we think God is. See, when you see that God values you, that God has chosen you, you lose the need to justify yourself. You, you don't have to justify every single decision, every single word, every single movement when you know that God loves you. When you see that God has taken the pain and the shame and the sin of you and me and every person upon his shoulders, you're able to do the same thing for another person. God gives you the capacity to do that for another person. See, because of Jesus, we can have a different path. Notice what it says, 1 Peter 22. He, Jesus, committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you and I have been healed. See, Jesus has provided a different way in relationships. And the healing that Jesus provides just isn't your relationship with God. It can be your relationship with other people. When you and I choose the path of Jesus when it comes to conflict, rather than avoiding it, running away from it, when we choose the path and follow in Jesus' footsteps, we can experience healing. The greatest demonstration of love ever experienced in human history came about when Jesus laid down his life for you and me. And the only way that we can learn to carry ourselves with that kind of love is to remind ourselves of Jesus and be open to the Holy Spirit that leads us to be more and more like Jesus every single day. That is how, friends, you can overcome resentment. That is how the bitterness in your relationship can be rooted out. It's not you mustering up some more courage or just being a better person. It's when your mind is on Jesus and the Holy Spirit fills you up, you are able to handle that conflict well. You know, I, I know there's some of you here who are hurting. Um, some of you here have resentment 
and bitterness in your relationships because of conflict. I know that. And I know that it can feel in the midst of that like there is no path forward for that relationship. I know what that's like because I've been there in relationships where it just feels too overwhelming, too big, too much to manage. But here's my hope for you. My hope is that God gives you the courage and the boldness this week to fight for the relationships that you feel like are crumbling. My hope is that God gives you boldness and courage to fight for restoration, to fight for things to be healthy and good and vibrant again. Not to shy away from conflict, not to brush it underneath the rug, but to address it head on because your relationships matter. God wants you to have healthy relationships. So here's what I'm gonna do. I, I wanna ask you two questions. And then I wanna take a moment for us to pray together. Um, the first question is this. Is there a conflict that you have been avoiding? And if so, who is it with? Is there a conflict that you have been avoiding? And if so, who is it with? Some of you are looking at each other. Um, Second question is this, this week, how can you use conflict as an opportunity for grace? So rather than conflict being something to be avoided, rather than conflict being, being something to be minimized, how can you use that conflict to be an opportunity for grace in that relationship that you're experiencing some brokenness? Here's my hope. May God give you and me boldness this week, courage this week to fight for health in our relationships because God cares about our relationships. I wanna pray for you and me um, and uh, we'll transition to uh, communion, but let's pray together. God, I, uh, I pray for every person in this room who is saying there is a conflict is going on in my life that is so big, so overwhelming, so discouraging. I know what that's like. It's so easy to lose hope. It's so easy for just discouragement to win and you feel paralyzed. And so I just pray that you would bring comfort and encouragement in this place. For every person in this room, wherever relationships are at, I pray that you would give encouragement. Um, God, there have been conflicts that we have avoided, partly because of fear. We don't know what to say, don't know how to say it, we think it's gonna get worse, but I love what you said. Matthew 18, you said in the midst of the conflict, as you're going through and it's stressful and you're going through the process, you said that is where you are. You are present in the conflict. You are present in the dysfunction. You're present in the tension. You're present in, in the words, the hard conversations. You are there. And so we pray, God, that you would guide us as we fight this week for our relationships. Let us use the conflict we're experiencing as an opportunity for grace and that through this, the people with whom we have conflict would experience Jesus' love and grace in and through us. So help us, God, to fight for those relationships this week, not to discard them, not to yield to the dysfunction, but to choose a different path. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.